Hello and welcome to my presentation on exercise prescription and testing uh, for CRAM. Um, so what we're going to do is get into these two tests that we want to focus on today. Um, so the aims of this lecture really to highlight the importance of appropriate exercise training for people with chronic health issues. Uh, identify and encourage appropriate exercise training for these people uh, with these chronic conditions and then facilitate exercise field testing into the incremental shuttle walk test and the six minute walk test uh, for distance. So that's what we want to do today. So what are our objectives? Um, so we need to recognize the limiting factors uh, to our exercise therapy and possibly identify strategies to reduce these. Um, so if you think back to PET um, and what we did um, there, it will be very similar, particularly with the cardiac rehab. Um, we want to identify appropriate exercise prescription for patients with chronic respiratory and cardiac disorders. You should already be familiar with cardiac disorders. You did that for the PET exam. For respiratory, really, it is no different. Um, obviously, the symptoms will be similar but not the same. Um, we want to understand the underlying theory involved in our choice of exercise prescription and our choice of exercise test and then carry out these exercises effectively um, and monitor them. You also might be doing this in conjunction with a uh, exercise physiologist um, as part of the wider MDT. Um, so just remind you about your contraindications to exercise. Um, these are highlighting who's at risk. Obviously, when you're dealing with cardiac and respiratory patients, they're all effectively at risk. They all have some precautions and contraindications to exercise, and they must be signed off um, by uh, the doctor that's specialising in why they're in hospital in the first place, um, rather than just exercising them willy-nilly. Um, we want to make sure that they have an empty stomach before they're exercising. We want to make sure they're not pyrexic uh, and they don't have any sort of viral infection. We want to make sure that their systolic uh, blood pressure is not greater than 200 or their diastolic uh, less than 100. Um, if their resting pulse is greater than 120 beats per minute, then they shouldn't be exercising. Um, if they've got a painful or swollen joint that is red and warm to the touch, again, should they be exercising? If they are osteoporotic, um, we need to be careful um, with weight bearing status. Um, and just to re um, tell them that, you know, if they get any pain on exercising, then they should really stop. Um, when completing these tests, obviously pain uh, as tolerated. So it's our old friend, the PARQ, the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire. Um, particularly in group environments, this is where you'll generally get your respiratory and cardiac patients. Um, you need to know, I mean, obviously all cardiac patients will have had tightness in their chest. Um, they might get um, dizziness or lightheadedness. You've got to watch out for your fainters. Um, they might have blood pressure issues. They might have joint issues. Um, they might have balance issues. Um, and they might have other issues and other that we've just not um, thought about. That's why it's so important to ask, particularly if you get this in a class or a testing environment. Um, what we need to do now is just discuss these two common tests that we use um, for, for assessment uh, or exercise testing for, for people with cardiac and respiratory conditions. This is the incremental shuttle walk test. You'll know it as the bleep test. Um, and then you've also got the six minute walk for distance test. So these two tests are the most commonly used. Um, and uh, if we were allowed to do the practical, then that's exactly um, what you do. Um, so the incremental shuttle walk test. Um, so what are the good things about it? One, it's a standardized speed. Um, uh, so you can take it up to a maximal test. Um, so there's a minimum clinically important difference of 54 meters. Um, the bleeps give prompts. Um, you can follow this up with the endurance shuttle walk test uh, quest 
uh, questionnaire. Um, and also they've got some, uh, whether the psychrometric testing around the bleep test is more a test of motivation than anything else. Although it has been proven, um, there's still debate about that. It's not a true measure of uh, endurance, it's a true med measure of motivation. Okay, and you can effectively learn the technique. There's a learning process that's happened. It's not as functional as we'd like it. Um, and it does take 12 minutes to complete. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a bit more time consuming. So if we were to do the six minute walk test, there's some standard instructions that go along with that, that you'll just effectively read um, from the script. Um, you know, the aim of this test is to walk as far as possible in six minutes. You will lock, walk along this hallway between the markers as many times as you can in six minutes. Okay, um, we've seen six minute walk tests done on the treadmill. It doesn't really matter, but it should be done in this way if we're going to standardize it uh, and keep things going. Obviously, giving the patient uh, a chance uh, for any questions, um, which is good. Um, and making sure that we have the patient's consent at all times. Um, so if we just look at the pros and the cons of the six minute walk test, it's been psychometrically tested, it measures endurance, it gives more of an indication of function, um, which is all important. Um, also allows rest if need be. Again, the minimum clinically important difference is 48 meters. Um, it's only six minutes long, so it's half the time of the incremental shutting walk test. Um, the, the negative things is that um, verbal cues affect performance. Um, so because there's no bleeps, normally the incremental shuttle walk test is in silence and you're just listening to the bleeps. Here, um, verbal cues, either positive or negative, will affect the result. Um, and it might not be maximal as the speed is not set. So we've got to think about all these things. So if we were to summarize this, um, the six minute walk test for distance and the incremental shuttle walk test are both valid and reliable tests of functional exercise capacity in people with uh, respiratory problems like COPD. Um, so the six minute walk test is widely used in other chronic respiratory disorders simply because it only takes six minutes. Um, however, there's a learning effect for both these tests um, and it might be better to perform both to get a true measure. And again, we want that cluster of data recorded over several times. Um, the six minute walk test is sensitive to changes in the way it's conducted. Um, so if you're encouraging a person, if you're giving oxygen, um, if you're changing the track layout or the length or you're using a walker, um, these things need to be factored in if the test is to be repeated. Otherwise, uh, the validity and the reliability will be affected. Um, they're both strenuous tests for people with um, cardio or respiratory conditions, um, particularly uh, the incremental shuttle walk test because it's more of a maximal test. Uh, and as a result, we've got to think about those contraindications and precautions uh, before we do anything. So we're going to lead ourselves on to the breathless patient and talk about some of the strategies that we can use for that. Um, so we're obviously going to be using oxygen. We need to record how much oxygen and at what time frame the oxygen was used. We're going to use breathing control and we might use uh, rest positions for increased uh, ease. Um, so we haven't got that shortness of breath. Um, we're going to do some relaxation post-exercise to normalize their breathing. Uh, and we might also uh, think about using pacing if they're holding their breath, which is uh, not ideal. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is for worsening bronchospasm. Um, first of all, we want to be exercising in a controlled manner for the patient to gain confidence uh, and not go into a state of anxiety. We'll be using those breathing control and positions of ease. Um, we've got the EpiPen, the adrenaline, should we need it? Um, and we're monitoring um, basically respiratory conditions as well. Um, we want to always have their salbutamol inhaler there just in case they need it. <clears throat> That's more for their confidence than anything else, I think, uh, as well as a, a vaso, uh, sorry, bronchial dilator. So um, if we've got a patient with angina, obviously they're going to have their GTN spray handy. 
Um, we want to monitor their heart rate before, during and after, teach them about rate of perceived exertion uh, and about where they should be, or whether that's safe to exercise. So if we're using the Borg scale, we want to be 13 out of 20 and then take their blood pressure pre-exercise and post-exercise. So we're just monitoring at all times. And then finally, if we look at diabetes, um, we might have uh, have to have some 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 a biscuit or a glucose drink if the patient is insulin controlled. We've got to educate them uh, about um, their energy expenditure during exercise, uh, and they need to consider this, uh, which will be different for every single patient. And we also need to consider the impact of any neuropathy or or any visual disturbance uh, when prescribing exercise. So. There you go, that's a kind of whistle-stop tour through the talk of, of what we've done. So if we look back to those objectives, um, we've recognised the limiting factors with exercise therapy or exercise testing in this, this scenario. We're going to think about those contraindications and those precautions to exercise. Um, and then uh, we, what I'd like you to do is just search the literature and have a look at some of the stuff um, on the Cram Blackboard website um, to do with exercise field testing. Um, but we do these, use these in clinical practice. It's more the job of the exercise uh, physiologist, to be honest, to do the exercise testing. Uh, but as physios, we have to get involved with that as well. So a quick whistle-stop tour, a um, little bit of pet revision. Uh, pet creeps into everything, obviously. Uh, and we will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.